Wireless data. It's what connects us to just about everything. And full power license spectrum is how it gets from point A to point B. Americans will use five times more 5G data by 2027. To make sure all Americans benefit from secure, reliable 5G networks, we need more full power license spectrum. Go to more5gspectrum.com to learn more. Last week, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Roberts, gave a speech. This is the first time uh, since pre-COVID that I've uh, given remarks uh, of this uh, extent, certainly before an audience. It's rare for the justices to be out and about in public, so it's not really a surprise that this speech was a little stilted. Roberts was accepting an award. His language was filled with reverence for the work he does. He even quoted a former justice who called the court a symbol of faith. But the main message Robert seemed to have was that no matter what you've heard, the court is doing great. Our court consists of nine appointees by four presidents. We deal with some of the most controversial issues before the country, yet we maintain collegial relations with each other. When I wander down the halls and see a colleague, I am always happy to have the chance to chat. He was giving real, like, Alfred E. Newman, what me worry vibes <laughs> to me, where he was just sort of like, it's fine. It's fine. We all get along here. We don't ever raise our voices in anger. Yeah, he is very much the, like, the it's fine dog in the burning building, if, if you want to pick through the memes. Jay Willis is the editor of Balls and Strikes, a blog that covers the court. Even as the public can see that the court is doing all manner of unhinged reactionary Uh, decisions that are out of step with what most people want, that he's sort of trying to repackage, reframe this as, actually, it's all business as usual. Everything is just fine. Is the Chief Justice on the defensive here? Does it feel like that to you? I think so. So a big part of John Roberts's project at the Supreme Court is packaging what the court does as neutral and apolitical. He believes part of the Supreme Court's power is its mystery. Yes, it's, it's mythos as, you know, it is special and different because the people who comprise it are lawyers who wear pajamas to work. The problem for the Chief Justice is that the American public doesn't seem to believe that the Supreme Court is apolitical. Not anymore, anyway. And they have ample evidence for this belief. Last year's decision overturning the constitutional right to abortion, for instance, which most Americans wanted to preserve. More recently, Justice Clarence Thomas's friends with financial benefits relationship with an influential GOP donor has also raised eyebrows. But for Jay, there's something else. John Roberts, he was making this argument about the court right before some of its most controversial business is about to go public. After all, June is decision season for the court. So for the next month, you're going to be hearing relentless conversation about the chief justice and his eight colleagues. Listening to this speech, Jay couldn't help but wonder, what will the next month sound like? Will journalists take Roberts at his word? Historically, in my view, the legal press corps has not done a good job of reporting on the Supreme Court, of reporting on the impact of its policymaking on real people. But I do think that especially since the leak of the Dobbs opinion and then the actual Dobbs opinion that overturned Roe v. Wade, um, I think that woke a lot of people up to the reality, which is that the court has is political and has always been political, and also that this court is more conservative than any court um, that anyone alive remembers. Going into June, do you think all this criticism that's been mounting of the Supreme Court as an institution, how it works, is going to translate to more critical coverage of the decisions they're about to release? I certainly hope so. And if not, I will be there to get upset with them on Twitter about it. Today on the show, a wild year at the Supreme Court is about to reach a crescendo. 
We're here with a user guide for the weeks ahead. I'm Mary Harris. You're listening to What Next. Stick around. China is making 370% more 5G spectrum available than America. Tell Congress to restore FCC auction authority and allocate more 5G spectrum to make sure America leads the industries and innovations of the future. Go to more5gspectrum.com to learn more. The hearing will come to order. Good morning, Judge. Welcome to the blinding lights. Coming soon from Slate Podcast. Members of this committee have asked, who is the real Clarence Thomas? What is the real Clarence Thomas? Which is the real Clarence Thomas? Justice Thomas was a a radical. He's this almost like Shakespearean figure. He was closely aligned with Malcolm X and the most liberal of ideology. And that is a puzzle. I don't know that I would call myself an enigma. I'm just Clarence Thomas. I'm Joel Anderson, and on this season of Slow Burn, we'll explore how a black man from rural Georgia went from being a college radical to a conservative icon. If having an experience in predominantly white spaces, particularly a traumatic experience, can radicalize you to the left, then it certainly can radicalize you to the right. You'll hear from his closest family and friends, including his political mentor. We had the lights turned way down low. And he said to me, Jack, do you know what this is? It's a high-tech lynching. And you'll hear from women who knew Thomas long before he was on the Supreme Court. He would say, I'm their guy. I don't think he ever realized that he was being manipulated. I don't think he realizes it now. We'll look at where Thomas came from, his rise to power, and how he's brought the rest of us along with him, whether we like it or not. So look. When I talk about Clarence Thomas, there are going to be two groups of listeners, and neither one are going to like what I say. So my question to you is, why am I doing this interview? Slow Burn Season 8, Becoming Justice Thomas, is out Wednesday, May 31st, wherever you listen. Did did you ever forgive Joe Biden for that? Yeah, I had to forgive him. I never forget, no. I asked Jay Willis to start out by explaining just how precipitously the public's faith in the Supreme Court has declined over the last few months. He said the trouble really began a little more than a year ago. That's when a draft of the Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade got leaked to Politico. The impact was immediate. So first I'll talk a little bit about the numbers. After the leak, the court's approval rating fell to 44%. That was down 10 points from just a month earlier. Uh, it fell even even further uh, after Dobbs actually came out um, to 38%. Now, since then, it's rebounded a little bit, but it's still, uh, to use a technical legal term, bad. But I also think this tracks the court's lurch to the right over the past six years, from the confirmations of Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh uh, to Amy Coney Barrett just before the 2020 election. And then how quickly the change in the court's composition changed what the court was doing. This conservative supermajority, it didn't just overrule Roe, right? It's expanded gun rights, rewritten the Second Amendment. It's continued to roll back voting rights. It's limiting the executive branch's ability to meaningfully govern. And these are three things in common. These are all pet causes of the conservative legal movement, things that they've spent decades working on. They're all broadly unpopular with the American people. It would be exceedingly difficult to pass this stuff through the legislative process. And they are all ascendant policies, thanks to a Supreme Court that is willing to sort of rubber stamp this agenda. And of course, the fact that the Dobbs opinion the opinion overturning Roe versus Wade, the fact that it leaked at all before it was actually released raised this ethical question of, hold it, what's going on at the court (laughs) that this is coming out in this way and what does it mean, right? I think that's right. A lot of the sort of uh, hand-wringing 
about the leak and the impropriety of the leak came in the form of, you know, this leak, this undermines the Supreme Court's legitimacy, which I think has the problem exactly backwards, right? That the, the leak is not evidence of the court's legitimacy. The court is leaking because it is in sort of this existential crisis. It is, it is an institution in turmoil. So it doesn't undermine the legitimacy, it underlines the illegitimacy. Ooh, I like that. Let's put that on a bumper sticker. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, I, I, th- I think that's absolutely right. I think the, the leak showed just how in turmoil this court is, how quickly it's changing, how quickly it's changing composition has led to a change in its agenda and the scope of the rulings it's willing to hand down. Yeah. As the year went on, the questions kept coming about the ethics of the court. And I feel like, of course, like one of the best ways you could see both how protected the justices have historically been from public scrutiny and how there's this newfound interest in piercing the veil of secrecy around the justices is by looking at what's happened with Clarence Thomas over the last month or two. Sure. Back in April, ProPublica reported that Thomas is really close with a billionaire, a guy named Harlan Crow, who's treated Thomas and his family to all kinds of things like trips on yachts and planes. Can you describe what happened here? I mean, it's a little hard to remember at some point because at this point, like if we're counting Clarence Thomas ethics scandals over the past couple months, I think I'm definitely on my second hand, right? Like the five fingers on one hand are already accounted for. But yeah, Clarence Thomas has spent years availing himself of, let's say, the perks of being one of the court's most conservative justices, uh, getting jetted around the globe on the private planes and super yachts of Harlan Crow, this Republican mega donor with a very fake sounding Batman villain name. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> on the one hand, like it is dismaying to see someone entrusted with a tremendous amount of power and life tenure, no meaningful accountability mechanism, sort of in the pocket of somebody with this kind of wealth and this vested interest in the court's work. But sort of to your point, I don't know that it's surprising And there's an element of like, didn't we all know this in the defense that Harlan Crow (laughs) offers up? Yeah. Which is like, aren't we allowed to have friends? He's my friend. And I I treat him to things. Like I treat lots of people. So it's cool, right? Yeah, I I certainly agree with that. And I also think that you sort of see that reflected in many of the conservative defenses of Thomas which have centered on, oh, you know, technically under under this rule, this subsection of this rule, which was modified at this time, what he did wasn't, you know, an ethical lapse. Um, These sort of very technical, legalistic, formalistic defenses of his conduct. I think that speaks to the pedestal on which the court sits within the legal community, where normal people understand that what's happening with Clarence Thomas and Harlan Crow is corruption in any meaningful sense of the word. So to the extent that under the rules, this is not corruption or this may or may not be corruption depending on the circumstances, to me that's not, that's not a defense of Clarence Thomas's conduct. That is a damning indictment of the rules as inadequate to function as safeguards against the type of undue influence that people in a functioning democracy uh, don't want. The Senate tried to hold a hearing on Supreme Court ethics. They did. And they invited John Roberts to come. What happened when they did that? So John Roberts declined. He says that separation of powers concerns um, prevent him from testifying before the Senate. John Roberts appears to be unfamiliar with the other phrase that we all learned in high school, checks and balances, which for some reason don't apply here. Yeah, it just feels like going into this busy season for the court, there's now this open question about the justice's authority. And is there really anyone minding them or who can mind them? I am of two minds about this. Like 
on the one hand, I am glad that more people than ever understand that this tribunal of nine unelected lawyers getting to decide who gets civil rights and who doesn't uh, is not a great system, not a great way for running what is supposed to be a representative democracy. On the other hand, that is not going to change between now and the end of June, right? They are going to hand down a series of decisions as they do every June with tremendous consequences for a lot of people. So it is good that people understand that the system is bad and does not change how bad it is and how bad it's going to continue to be. After the break, what to expect with the upcoming cases this term and how the media should be talking about them. Bringing greater scrutiny to the Supreme Court starts with court watchers like Jay Willis. But Jay has got some gripes with his fellow SCOTUS reporters. The main one being that most coverage, up until now, has tended to just regurgitate judges' opinions without offering a lot of critical analysis. So I asked Jay, what should this critical analysis look like? He says one of the first things you should know going into this season of decisions is that the deck is stacked, meaning the court is only ruling on cases that the conservatives want to hear. It's simple math. Obviously, it takes five to make a majority, but it only takes four for the court to grant cert to agree to take up a case and hear oral arguments. What this means, practically speaking, is that with a six-justice conservative supermajority, the court can look at all of the different cases that come before it, and the conservative wing can lose not just one, but two votes. They can lose two votes and still get the cases they want to hear on the docket. So it's more likely that a case that a conservative would want to rule on would just get in front of the justices in the first place. Absolutely. And like sort of by the same grim math, unless the liberals can get at least one Republican justice to vote with them, they're just basically locked out of the agenda altogether. So like the cases that come before the court, the scope of, of potential outcomes are really either moving the law to the right, often dramatically, or just like barely preserving the status quo for now. Looking at the court critically also means putting the justices' opinions into proper historical context. For instance, this year, the court's going to rule on a case known as Allen v. Milligan. It'll decide whether legislators in Alabama violated the Voting Rights Act and diluted the power of black voters with their new congressional maps. And this is a case about fair representation. African Americans in Alabama are 27 percent of the population, and yet we have only one of the seven seats. It's simply not fair. The case involves the Jay says looking at this case in isolation, you'd miss how the justices have been tinkering with voting rights for years. Typically, discussions of these voting rights cases will focus throughout on what the decision says, what the dissent says, and then just sort of leave it there for other people to parse. And I think that's wrong. I think that's doing an incomplete job of informing readers of just how meaningful the court's work is. So like, this case is going to come down. It is almost certainly going to be bad for democracy. I think that coverage of this should center the court's, again, decades-long war on the Voting Rights Act. And I don't think that's too much hyperbole, right? John Roberts was a, a junior official in the Reagan Department of Justice. He was writing memos about the Voting Rights Act, and he talked about how, in his view, violations should not be, and I'm quoting here, too easy to prove. He said that, it, that the Voting Rights Act gave rise to intrusions on state and local voting processes. And I guess people who disagree with you might say like, well, but he argued that so long ago and he was just doing his lawyerly duty of, you know, coming up with what his client, the government at the time, wanted. What would you say to that? I think to people who bring up that sort of argument, I just 
I just disagree with sort of the implicit premise of that, that judges immediately shed their political views, their histories, their personal views, their policy preferences, their biases, both conscious and unconscious. You can't just shed that the moment you, you know, take your oath of office and you put a robe on. Under Roberts, the court has consistently handed down these anti-democracy decisions. And I think unless you understand how long that's been going on, the story of that case will be incomplete. You've argued, too, that reporters should focus a lot more on where Supreme Court cases come from, like who's bringing them, how they're funded. I'm wondering if there's a case that's set to be decided this year where you think that's especially important to just point out, like, this is the origin story for this case. For sure. So I'd point to Ed Bloom, who is behind the challenges to affirmative action policies at Harvard and the University of North Carolina. It is our hope that the justices will end the use of race and ethnicity in college admissions. Edward Blum's organization is arguing Harvard and the University of North Carolina are penalizing certain applicants who are often Asian and white while giving preference to others who are often black and Hispanic. He is sort of the the engine behind the organization Students for Fair Admissions that is bringing these challenges. But it's really important to understand that this is not Ed Bloom's first colorblindness rodeo. Ed Bloom has been running these challenges for years. I guess, why does it matter to know that he's the guy behind this? Because in some ways, it's unsurprising. It's like, yeah, people have interests. <laughs> they commit to their bit. And they keep bringing these cases. So why is it salient for us to know that there's one guy who's kind of behind the curtain here? I think sort of his his maneuvering, his strategizing about this just shows that like the fight against affirmative action that plays out in federal courts is not like this organic thing that keeps coming up from, you know, these these poor 19 year olds who were disadvantaged in an unfair process. They're coming up because like one wealthy guy with a lot of time on his hands is spending a lot of time and effort to figure out the precise legal strategy that will get his way. The one other thing I'll say is that the basic logic of the critique of affirmative action hasn't meaningfully changed since the court decided its first major affirmative action case in 1978. So if the court bans affirmative action this year, it's not going to be because, you know, Ed Bloom and company came up with better arguments than they did in 2003 or 2016. It's going to be because they finally figured out the right words to say to the right panel of justices where they could count to at least five votes. Hmm. Yeah. What you're saying is that it's important to understand that these cases are driven by movements that are pushing for years and sometimes decades and learning from previous failed attempts. That's absolutely right. And I think you could also see that pretty clearly in the challenges um, to the right to abortion care. The conservative legal movement has made anti-choice politics sort of the, the fuel for, for Republican politics. But when the court kept turning them away, you know, conservatives thought that they were going to overturn Roe in 1992 with Planned Parenthood v. Casey. They were shocked and, and furious and dismayed. But wh whenever they failed to get Roe overturned, you know, they didn't give up. They didn't say, well, I guess it's decided now. I guess we better move on to some other policy, some other cause. They learned from those failures and they refined their arguments a little bit, sure. But also principally, they invested in creating a court and a federal judiciary that would be more receptive to their arguments. You've left me in this place where I feel pretty stuck <laughs> going into the end of the Supreme Court term. When you look for ways to kind of get the court out of this position where it seems stuck right now, what do you see? Unfortunately, given practical political realities, the way to fix this court is to expand it. And I say, unfortunately, given practical political realities, because you know we have a one-vote Democratic majority in the Senate, and the House is controlled by Republicans. 
we are not at the place legislatively where a court expansion bill passed by both chambers of Congress is going to land on Joe Biden's desk tomorrow. But it is the only one that addresses the immediate problem with this court, which is that it is handing out opinions that are wildly out of touch with what normal everyday Americans want. And there are also other, you know, really good Supreme Court reform ideas. You know, we've talked in our conversation about ethics reform. Obviously, ethics reform would be good. But Clarence Thomas having to fill out a couple extra pieces of paperwork is not going to change the fact that he has life tenure and one ninth of power on the Supreme Court. I kind of think the same about the term limits. Obviously, ter term limits would be good, but like a term limits bill is not going to change the fact that six conservatives control the court now and will control the court next year, right? Like this all takes time to implement. And I just don't think we have that time right now. Yeah. I wonder if in some ways you think the way the conservative movement is behaving now is actually an opportunity for Democrats. Like when you see John Roberts saying, I won't come talk to you. When you see Ron DeSantis telling donors, you should elect me because I could get eight years in office and appoint even more conservative Supreme Court justices. They're explicitly putting on the table how protected this group has been. It's an opportunity to say, hold it, did we like that? <laughs> Absolutely. Just because Democrats can't pass a Supreme Court reform bill now does not mean that they should not be talking about it. Like this should be a talking point for them at every opportunity. It has never been easier in this country to attack the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has never been more deserving of those attacks. Let me return to the conservative legal movement's push to overturn Roe. Again, when at all those times when they failed to overturn Roe, they didn't stop. They kept pressing the issue. They kept talking about it. They kept fundraising off it. They kept promising to appoint anti-choice judges if they had the opportunity. I think Democrats need to take a similar lesson from what ultimately proved to be successful there, right? They need to start making the case for Supreme Court reform, for Supreme Court expansion now, so that when they have the opportunity, they're not suddenly starting from square one. Democrats can look at the way that Republicans are treating the court as a political body with policy-making power that's important to control. I think Democrats should absolutely take a lesson from that and talk about the court in the same way. Jay, I'm really grateful for your time and for you coming on the show. Thanks for doing it. For sure. Thanks for having me. Jay Willis is the editor-in-chief of Balls and Strikes. He also wrote a version of this piece for Slate's website. We did a whole package on the upcoming Supreme Court term. It's got stuff not just from Jay, but from Dahlia Lithwick, from over at the Amicus podcast, and from one of the wittiest Supreme Court watchers out there, Mark Joseph Stern. Go click now. All right, that's the show. If you're a fan of what we're doing here, what next? And at Slate.com. The best way to support all of us is to join Slate Plus, our membership program. Go on over to Slate.com slash whatnextplus to find out how. What Next is produced by Elena Schwartz, Rob Gunther, Anna Phillips, Paige Osborne, and Madeline Ducharme. We are led by Alicia Montgomery with a little boost from Susan Matthews. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations here at Slate. And I'm Mary Harris. Go track me down on Twitter. Say hello. I'm at Mary's desk. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you back here tomorrow.